third. Uh. <laughs> right. So um, I'm just gonna take a step back because we have discussed lots of things about uh, brain emotion and whatnot and SDEs, but uh, I want to get back to the problem we're actually uh, uh, we're interested in, um, and just give one example of how this can be useful. I mean, basically the point is uh, compute or approximate. Um, a sample from uh, distribution uh, with density That's, that's the problem we want to solve, right? We want to be able to, uh, given, let me maybe put in more precise terms, given this function V, um, that we can call the potential function, so given some kind of oracle access to this function V, how to, in the most possible efficient way, to come up with samples from this distribution. And um, yeah, why is this difficult? I mean, there's a couple of reasons, but one can argue that the most difficult aspect maybe of, of uh, being able to come up with this distribution is the fact that you need to integrate, right? So even if you're writing kind of what's the probability of something happening in this space, I, I potentially need to compute this integral and integrating in high dimensions is difficult. So the question is how? One, I guess, on, one of the approaches of what we're covering in this reading group is like circumventing the fact that you need this integral, right? doing things that do not involve directly uh, some form of integration. Uh, we'll further assume uh, that V is convex and maybe Lipschitz, uh, smooth, etc. So, hopefully, these properties allow us to get more precise complexity results. But in principle, the main assumption we want to make here is that V is convex, which is equivalent to say that this distribution is log concave, right? In the sense that taking the logarithm of this density gives me minus V, which is going to be a concave function. Um, And the approach, at this, in this reading group, right, uh, approach um, is going to be to um, uh, we're going to consider this Langevin diffusion. which is uh, driven by this uh, SD, right? So dxt minus gradient of v of xt uh, dt plus, um, I hope I'm not forgetting some constant factor here, but I think that that's basically the Langevin dynamics, okay? And, and the point is, uh, what I wanna prove today is actually the, the stationary distribution from this dynamics is gonna be exactly that density over there. So the approach is gonna be, let's just run the Langevin diffusion for long enough and take the sample that is uh, given by that. Uh, by this guy with t sufficiently large. Okay. And now you can see, you, for, for running this thing, I mean, there is no need to explicitly integrate anything. Uh, and certainly not the density of e to the minus v. Uh, now I want to cover an application. So let me say by now that already this problem of, of uh, computing or approximating samples from these uh, log concave densities is a very important problem in mathematics, but also in 
all sorts of applications. Um, I just want to cover one specific application to maybe give some perspective on this. Uh, and that's going to be on, on a problem on which I have personal interest, which is a uh, differential bias. Rather than specifically considering or just focusing on land and diffusion, I, I'm just, I just want to point out that this problem of sampling from low concave densities is it's an important one. It appears at least in the setting of uh, differential privacy. OK, so let me go back to uh, a very classical problem in optimization that we call uh, empirical uh, uh, risk optimization, which is also called uh, SAA in, in maybe more the operations research literature. Um, basically, if you have uh, some loss function that, um, let's say, RD to some uh, data space Z to R, this is my loss function. And then I have a, a sample. Uh, from some distribution P, say. Right, so what I want to do is I want to find a model given by these D parameters that better adjusts to the data in terms of this loss function. So I want to minimize over x in some set x. Let's assume this is a closed convex set. Uh, F sub S of X, which is given by 1 over N, summation F of X, uh, Ci. With I equals 1 to N. Okay, so this is, yeah. And I, I'm, I'm not going to go into specific examples, but think, you can think of this F maybe as the squared law. So you're, you're running just, I mean, you're trying to fit uh, a linear model with squared laws, uh, SVMs. Right, where you use the hinge loss and logistic regression, anything sort of fits within this. Right? Um, okay. So, are there any questions about this? Okay, we we're interested in solving this problem. Now, solving this problem means designing an algorithm that we're going to call A, that takes these inputs, right, and data points, and comes up with a solution X. Uh, and we're going to evaluate the performance of this algorithm in terms of uh, what we can call the risk, or the expected risk, which is going to be the expectation over, let me say, A and the data, or, oh, sorry, data here is fixed, actually. A may be a randomized algorithm. So let me call this minimum value that we have over here FS star. And we just want to, like, our measure of efficiency is how close we can get to the optimal error. OK? Uh, and what I want to impose, and this might seem out of the blue, but there's good reasons to do this, is uh, we want A to be uh, private with respect to the data. Okay, So I need to formalize that. What does it mean that this algorithm A is not leaking information to of some of these individuals I have here sample? OK, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to write a definition. We can maybe discuss it. But um, this is like a well-established notion of uh, differential privacy. So here. Uh, epsilon is some parameter which is greater than zero. Um, and what we want to impose for A is that over the randomization of A and um, for any uh, event E subset of X, 
we want the probability that um, A of S satisfying this uh, property cannot be too much larger than uh, the probability that this happens when I replace one of the elements of the data set in an arbitrary way. Um, let, me, let me find S prime as So it's basically the same data set, but where I change this zi by some zi prime, okay? So this definition of differential privacy is basically encapsulating the fact that the algorithm is somehow stable to replacements of one of the users from the data set which, on which the algorithm was trained, okay? And um, yeah, it's a probabilistic notion, so in fact, uh, the algorithm is, has to be necessarily randomized for this to, to even make sense. And uh, yeah, I, I'm not gonna discuss here today how this induces privacy, but I guess it is somewhat natural at this point that if, if you're saying that replacing an individual leads to outcomes that are very similar in both cases, it, it's somehow quantifying that um, these outcomes are nearly indistinguishable up to this e to the epsilon term. Um, in fact, you can, you can also translate it, this in terms of the log likelihood function of A being upper bounded by something like that. Um, yeah. So what, this is for every switch? For any possible switch, yeah. yeah. And yeah, it's uh, maybe too strong, but, uh, but for now, I mean, what I wanna show is that actually you can satisfy this um, using something like this density, okay? I mean, I need to propose an algorithm, right? So I'm, now I'm, I'm gonna propose an algorithm, which is called uh, uh, the exponential mechanism. And it does the following. So I'm almost cheating here because this, this is gonna be a density. So basically what I'm gonna write is a density function, but uh, let me just write with probability So the density function on which I'm selecting a certain hypothesis here is gonna be proportional to, or yeah, it's gonna be proportional to the ex negative exponential of the uh, fs of the data set s. Um, yeah, evaluated at x. So what is this effectively doing, right? Is, is promoting solutions x that achieve low value, right? If, if this is low, uh, that means that with the negative, you're, we're relatively having a higher weight for this solution compared to others, right? Uh, you can also think of this like a, as a Gibbs distribution, Gibbs distribution where this is your potential, right? So you're basically promoting functions which have low, uh, low risk. And um, so there's, yeah. And this is, yeah, you, as long as you can sample efficiently from this distribution, you can use this algorithm. Um, what I'm not gonna prove is, is what is the accuracy guarantee that you obtain from this, but you can at least intuitively think that if you're promoting solutions with low risk, there should be like at least an expectation and guarantee in terms of what risk this algorithm may achieve, okay? Uh, and that's something that was proved in the paper by um, Vasily Smith and Takurta. In 2014, that's this is the first paper in stochastic convex optimization with differential privacy. Uh, what they prove essentially is that uh, the expected value of sampling from this distribution uh -huh, 
is upper bounded by something which is basically the dimension divided by n times epsilon up to an absolute constant. Okay, so for very high dimensional instances, this is not so good, but it's basically telling you that you need a certain sample size to get non-trivial guarantee. It turns out that for pure privacy, in the sense of the definition I just posed there, actually this rate is optimal. So already this mechanism is giving you the best, um, the best error you can achieve given the constraint of differential privacy. That's the point is like this distribution, this Gibbs distribution is such that well, it I mean, achieves no error. The, the differential privacy part you're I, controlling the, the part yeah. of the No, what, what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna prove that this method is differentially private because the proof is very easy. Okay. Okay. But the accuracy part is maybe it might take a little bit and it's kind of deviating from, from what we really want to do. So I'm just referring to this uh, very important paper of uh, you can see the result there. So yeah, good point. Now let's let's go into uh, claim. Um, uh, the exponential mechanism. is uh, epsilon db. Well, I haven't specified what is beta, right? Beta is a temperature parameter you need to adjust. Okay, so uh, for um, beta at least um, 2 over n. Uh, let me check this. Epsilon n divided by 2. So as you have more data, as your sample size is larger, you can afford to have a higher temperature. Uh, that's going to give better accuracy. And um, I mean, basically, yeah. Yeah, I mean, for, for the sake of privacy, what we know, I mean, let's see the proof, because it's, it's, uh, it's pretty easy. So all we need to do in this case, I mean, I, I didn't mention it here, but when this A of S has a density, this, uh, this, this probability ratio, right? That, that's basically what we're looking at, right? Probability of A, S on E divided by probability of A, S prime on E is upper bounded by E to the epsilon. That means that the ratio of the densities associated to both data sets are uniformly upper bounded by E to the epsilon. So what we need to understand is, is what is the ratio of the densities that are induced by both data sets? These are, these are the densities um, of exponential mechanism, right? And we need to prove that this is upper bounded by epsilon, okay? But luckily, I mean, we have a pretty explicit form for these, uh, for these densities, right? So we get a negative exponential fs of x, negative exponential of uh, fs prime of x, and then we have the normalizing factors that we, we're just going to write down here. OK, so what are those? I mean, for this guy, it's going to be the integral of e to the minus beta fs prime of y uh, dy. And here, down here, is going to be the uh, e to the minus beta fs of a, uh, y uh, dy. OK? So what I want you to notice is that we're almost done. Because I mean, these two, we can just write them down as an exponential of a difference of function. And the thing to notice is um, when you change the data set by one guy, there is a single loss function which is di different, but all of them, all the others are equal. Right? So what's what's here? Uh, the exponential of um, beta f s prime of x minus f s of x. Right? With the integrals, you can actually do something similar. Like you can maybe change this density. I mean, you're not changing anything, but um, sorry, y plus beta 
f s prime of y here, dy. You can just artificially introduce this term. Um, sorry, uh, s, not prime, just s. Now you have the difference of this and this, which is the same difference that we have over there, and these remaining factors. Right? Um, and this remaining factor is exactly integrating to what we have here in the denominator. So as long as we can prove a uniform upper bound on these things, uh, we're done. And as I said, that, that's just because of the way that these loss functions are defined. So uh, let me just leave this integral unspecified here because we only need to prove that this thing is uniformly bound. So, definition of, uh, of this thing. This is equal to uh, 1 over n sum of f of x di i equals 1 to n minus 1 over n sum of f of x di prime. So these are the data points from, oh sorry, it was prime here for s prime. And these without prime are for s. The assumption that I get for differential privacy is that all these guys are equal except for one position. Right? So there is some j coordinate such that these things will be different. f of x comma dj uh, prime minus f of x Zj, all the others cancel each other. Right? And I mean, I just need now an assumption on the range of the range of this function f. That's all I need. Right? So let's say, um, so for instance, if, if your set capital X is bounded, then for sure it's going to be. And if this function, let's say, are Lipschitz, you, you have you're going to have an upper bound. Um, ah. Let me just assume that this, this bound is 1, because otherwise th this factor is going to affect me uh, the theorem space. But anyway, the point is that like once you have this upper bound, the density ratio between fs of x and fs of x, fs prime of x, is going to be upper bounded by e to the minus beta um, over n, right? That's, that's what we get from this first ratio over here, and then the integral terms are bounded in exactly the same way, right? So first of all, you can apply the same uniform difference argument to these guys, and then you can left the two integrals here, which are exactly equal. So this is going to contribute in another, a second. So you just get e to the minus 2 rate over n, and we want this to be, oh no, not negative, sorry. I'm using. Um, I'm using triangle inequality here, so um, there, there's no negative terms. It's just 2 beta over n, and we want this to be less than or equal than e to the epsilon. So what do we need then? We need that, now the conclusion, beta can be at most n epsilon divided by 2. So I screwed up. For privacy, you need that beta cannot be too large. And that's as large as you can pick it. Um, in fact, for optimization, you would like to pick beta as arbitrarily large. Because as beta tends to infinity, this Gibbs distribution is going to concentrate more and more in the global minimal function. So the, you can see that there's like in, inherent trade-offs between the accuracy you can achieve and the privacy you can achieve. Perhaps the surprising thing is that this algorithm gets this trade-off optimally. So good news in the sense that you know the problem we're studying of lock concave sampling at least is important for this application. It gives me optimal rates for empirical risk minimization. Okay. So that was a small you know detour from from what we're actually doing in this reading group. Um, 
let's get back to uh, our actual interest. I don't know if there are any questions about this so far. It's good. So yeah, I said I was gonna prove convergence rates for, for the Langevin dynamics today, but I realized that uh, at least for those of us which are not super familiar with probability, there, there's an even more basic question we need to answer here, right? So I said in the beginning that this Langevin diffusion, when t goes to infinity, converges to this, to its stationary distribution. And we claim that this stationary distribution is this e to the minus b of x. Uh, but we haven't proved it yet. So what I'm going to do now is proving that result. At least you get the, the impression that you know we're doing the right thing with using the Langevin diffusion for, for sampling log concave distributions. And for that, I will go into the part of the lecture, uh, I mean, the the monograph we're following that refers to Markov semigroup theory. So I think that the inspiration for this might come from PDEs, right? Because or ODEs, people have used semigroup theory for that. Um, what I didn't know was like the, this, this stochastic counterpart, which is, which is very nice, actually. Um, so what's the idea? I mean, think about like, we're, we want to prove that the stationary distribution of the Langevin diffusion is, is e to the minus b. Like, how do we even prove that, right? It sounds very difficult to, uh, to get a handle on that. Uh, what this theory does is kind of relating properties of the of an SDE and its dynamics to some certain functional objects, right? So we're gonna, for instance, evaluate statistics associated to this diffusion. And the point is that statistics is gonna give you indirect information about the underlying dynamics. Uh, we're gonna be able to prove things like just using test functions in the same way that you would do it for PDEs or for ODEs, okay? That's if my understanding was correct about what's going on, but uh, okay. let's see. So. We consider a time homogeneous Markov chain. I mean, Markov process, I guess. Uh, so basically, this is a mechanism of representing transition probabilities, right? Right. This is if f is the indicator of a, you have sure. the probability that x t is in a given that you stand it at x. Yeah, sense. I mean, but in principle, yeah. you're not allowed to, if you take conti bounded continuous functions, you're not allowed to take indicators. Right, but you have but I guess you can take that. limits right, to that, right? right? So, so in that case, you're going to have basically the transition probabilities of your Markov process, right. so to speak. Right? Um, and that's, that's basically, I mean, if you, you can see that many of the questions we want to answer about a certain dynamics are already kind of answered by this class of test functions, right? Mm -hmm. which, is, which is, of course, sounds very, very useful. Um, using the fact that this is a Markov process, right, so by Markov's property, um, uh, we'll have the following, right, so we have that um, E0 is the identity, right, and um, Ps, Pt is equal to Pt, Ps, is equal to P uh, T plus S. Uh, and these are the properties that define a semigroup. So uh, just to clarify that, you know, wh why we're using that name. And when you have a semigroup, there's this fundamental object called the infinitesimal generator. Which is an analog of the time derivative of this, uh, of this semigroup. So how do you define it? You define it, um, then again, it's an operator acting on functions, which is defined as the limit as t tends to 0 plus uh, of ptf minus f divided by t. Right? So remember, p0 is the identity, so this is effectively p0. Mm -hmm. And 
yeah, I guess intuitively it's like this this infinitesimal generator is is capturing like the local dynamics of the thing. If you kind of integrate back from that, you can get PT, and PT of course gives you L. So it's you you I, I don't think you're just losing information by looking at this object, right? It's capturing the whole dynamics. Um, because of the process being time homogeneous. Right. Somebody can ask me why you don't take a derivative of x because it's homogeneity. Doesn't matter. Yeah. Changes. Yeah, would be the same. Yeah. Yeah. Um, cool. Okay. So, yeah, as an example, let's look at the infinitesimal generator of the Langevin diffusion. Right. So, uh, what happens to Langevin? Uh, I I I'm terrible at pronouncing French words, so sorry. Sorry about that. <laughs> Langevin, you say? We say Langevin. Langevin, yeah, it's impossible. So. <laughs> uh, what, is the, what is this dynamics, right? So it's V, Z, T equals uh, minus grad V, Z, T, D, T plus um, square root of two D, D, T. Okay, forgot the square root of two factor at the beginning of the... <laughs> so... <laughs> Um, you know, if you want to understand what the what the, the uh, Markov semigroup is or how it acts on functions, you can use Ito's lemma, right? So, f of z t is going to be an Ito process, and it's going to satisfy a different different uh, LD, right? So we can either do that, or I can go with a more heuristic argument we also use for deriving Ito's lemma. Um, so let, let's do that because. Just, just because we're starting the course, right? So, um, so this is just like a informal argument, right? We could use it, it was lemma to properly formalize this, okay? And, and it's also done in the book, but but let's let's go with the more informal argument to to make sense of this uh, local behavior of, of the function. So. Um, but for Ito, there's you need more regularity for that. And what's the kind of regularity you can need for that? So V has to be uh, essentially, uh, so the meaning of V has to be um, in any one, so it has to be, has to be in H1. Right? Uh, that's, so that's, that's perfectly <laughs> acceptable. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's not a problem. No, but the question is, like the functions F, mm. is the, you, you said there are Bounded and continuous. Radius like it might not be enough for Ito's lemma, right? Oh, that type of that you're gonna. Uh, yeah, I want to evaluate those things. Ah, right. Okay. So yeah. that I guess Mario's comment was about that, right? Yeah. And you're so yeah. using a class of test functions yeah, which might be weaker than. Minus two. You got the evolution. But then, yeah, I guess I guess you can take like a Z infinity with compact yeah. support <laughs> and then. Yeah. 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 The usual arguments. Okay, so what does this SDE min mean, right? We we have this this rewriting, this kind of rigorous rewriting of this stochastic differential equation using uh, this uh, stochastic integral, right? Um, yes, plus, um, and the point here is that the Brownian motion term doesn't have a changing variance, right? So when you integrate against Brownian motion, you're just gonna get um, Brownian motion. Right, so uh, I'm I'm just integrating this SDE um, and using the fact that this this integral is yeah is that right. What I want to do now is I want to take quote unquote a Taylor expansion around z zero to understand what is the infinitesimal semigroup doing. Right, so we're gonna take a function f. Right, so um, let f be in my class of test functions which we haven't specified. But we're going to assume that it's sufficiently regular. We're going to have that um, f of zt right, is equal to f of this. And just using Taylor's expansion, I'm going to get f of z0 plus um, oh, wait. 
Oh, sorry, sorry. I first, I first want to do the Taylor expansion on Z itself, right? So otherwise, I'm going to start mixing things to that. So the question is around zero, right? What's the behavior of this integral? And the point is, like, if this function is sufficiently regular, right? You, you might think of it as um, t times b of z zero, right? And this Brownian motion term stays. Uh, so this is equal to z zero minus t times grad v at z zero uh, plus square root of two dt plus something that is uh, small of t, right? That's my Taylor expansion for uh, with respect to time. Okay, and now I'm gonna take f and I'm gonna apply then again Taylor expansion for f. Okay, so. But uh, I guess the benefit here is that I can I can get to take expectations, right? Because uh, so what is the expectation of f of z t, right? And I'm I guess here. say that, right, is going to be, um, yeah. Oh, minus, minus t. So since z0 is equal to z, right, I can, um, I can effectively Taylor expand here. I'm going to get, uh, let's say, f of z, uh, small z. Um, and that's the only term which remains constant, right? All these other things depend on t, so they will go in the Taylor expansion, right? So um, we get minus t. Grad of z. Mm. Ah, sorry. Okay, so this is my constant term. This is what is changing with respect to time. And uh, I'm Taylor expanding this f, right? So my first order Taylor expansion is going to involve grad f mm -hmm. at z, comma this, mm -hmm. right? So we get minus t grad v z uh, plus square root of two v t uh, plus a small of t. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then uh, we get a second order term. So, and why do we get a second order term? Is because of Brownian motion, right? So Brownian motion, as we said. It has a behavior in terms of expectation of the absolute value as a square root of t, right? So that means that even when you go to second order, meaning that when you take the Hessian of f, uh, you're going to have a contribution from this guy. So what's the contribution? OK, we get square root of 2 t um, I mean, I can, I can write it down completely, but the point is that this guy is already going to have an t squared. t squared, and this one, um, yeah, mm -hmm. we don't even need to bother. But OK, let me, maybe I can put it this way. So plus expectation, so before even, um, yeah, I should take expectation here. So, um, Let's, let's just leave it this way, because uh, then we can evaluate this. OK, so we get f of z 
plus um, t or minus t times uh, grad f z comma grad v z this um, in expectation this Brownian motion term is going to give me zero so this term cancels but because of the expectation mm -hmm. and then this little of t you can drop it I mean it's going to have also like a little of t now this is the one which gets interesting because what is the I mean this is basically the covariance of the Brownian motion at time t mm -hmm. which we said is t times the identity uh, and that means that this inner product is going to give you the trace of the Hessian which is the Laplacian, right? So you get, um, so I hope I got this right. But that means that now we can take, you know, we can subtract uh, F itself, which is gonna drop this term. We can divide by T and take limits. And that's gonna give you a formula for the, uh, am I, maybe I missed something? Uh, Ah, there's a t, t factor here. Sorry, sorry. I said t times the identity, so that means that there's a t. There's this poor little. Yes, I, and then it's not going to drop when we take uh, limits, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, maybe it's easier. You could just use Ito's lemma. It's clear, it's just uh, you have to keep track of all these terms uh, carefully. I, I, I never keep track of these terms. Really. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, so yeah, uh, the point now is that if, if you want to evaluate this L of F, right, we said we can, we can take limits on um, T tending to zero, right, we said PT of uh, F minus F divided by uh, T. So let me jump ahead and say that thing, when you, when you take those evaluations, right, you're subtracting f, you get minus grad f. Um, and you know, this is a function of z. So what you're seeing on the board over there is the evaluation of that function for, for z. So you get, yeah. Um, and then you get this other term, which is the a plus operator of uh, f. So that means that L is this uh, is this operator given by uh, the Laplacian. And how do we want to write this? Let, let's just write L of f. Minus I guess you can also use integration by parts maybe to change this by something that just is an operator evaluated on F. Um, yeah, okay. So. Oh, did I mess something up? I mean, yeah, it should, there should be a square root of Q there and a square root of Q here. So you should get a two. But you have one half because you have a second order of cancel. Yeah, you have one half. You have one half. Cancel for this one. For, so yeah, that's <laughs> uh, that's right. That's right. Okay. Um, yeah. So something that is very useful also from this um, semi-group theory is this uh, Kolmogorov equations. So we're first going to look at this backward equation. Which says the following. For all t greater than or equal to 0, um, if you take the time derivative of ptf, which is, yeah, this is equal to, um, I mean, yeah, what we define as the, as, the, as this operator L is kind of the formal der time derivative at zero of the, 
of the process, right? So saying that is the same as saying this, and this is also, I mean, we're going to prove it, but um, but yeah, basically the point is that L commutes with ET, okay, for every time. Um, so, And yeah, this, this, this proof is also simple because of the way things are defined, right? So, uh, proof. Um, okay, what is dt of pt uh, f, right? It's, it's going to be the limit uh, as e uh, h, h tends to 0 plus of pt. Um, this is p pH applied to PT, F, this is equal to PT plus H because of the properties of the semi-groups, minus PT of F divided by T. So you can use the fact that this here, things commute, right? So you, um, you can write this as H minus identity divided by H. Oh, sorry, this is divided by H, taking the limit with respect to H. Uh, and this is applied to PTF, right? This is uh, equal to what we define as this, uh, the generator, infinitesimal generator of the semi group. And you can see that it does, the order doesn't matter, right? So we, we might as well just um, PT is a linear operator, so you can also factorize it from here. And so you'll get the same conclusion when you take the derivative inside. Uh, sorry, when you, yeah, yeah, I mean, it's gonna be L. So this is what I mean, okay? So the other is analogous. A little bit less than that, but let's see. Um, okay. Yeah. So, uh, okay. There is there is this operator, and then there is this. It's adjoint. Okay, and it's adjoint plays an interesting role. It's going to give us something which is called Kolmogorov's forward equation. Okay. Uh, so let's let's. Let's just go there. Um, so there's a dual equation. Which says the following. So let's consider a stochastic process that starts with some distribution with density P0. Okay, so I'm going to assume that it has density so that I can I can treat it as one of these test functions somehow, okay? Um, so what happens formally is that uh, the expected value of f of x t is going to be equal, right? So what I can do is I can integrate, that's the expectation, the semi-group at time t of f, um, with the density P0, right? So what I'm saying here is like my probability space is generated at time zero by this density. I let the system run for T units of time and then I take the expected value of it. Right? Um, and I can see formally this as an inner product between PT of F and P0. Not an inner product, but a uh, a duality pair. Mm -hmm. And that means that I can take the adjoint of this operator, PT. What, how does that look like? It looks the 
follows. Um, right? Yeah, and this some, somehow this thing has interpretation of taking things uh, now uh, forward in time. Okay? But yeah, this is now my, I guess, the probability space for which you're just taking expectation. And yeah, so you have that. And the conclusion that we get from here is that x um, t is going to have a distribution phi t, which is given by the adjoint of p, uh, t0. Okay. So I guess intuitively you would like to take pt to the process itself, but it doesn't make sense, right? pt is only applied to test functions. So if you want to really understand the evolution of the process as a probability distribution, you have to look at the adjoint. Yeah, on distributions, right, right. Uh -huh. Okay, um, so we'll call Mogorov's forward equation. Uh, is the equation that applies to, uh, to, its, to the adjoint operator. Okay, so what happens now if you take time derivative to this uh, expected values, right? So f d uh, p t star uh, of phi zero. Okay. So we just go back to the definition of what means this thing, right? So you have d t um, integral of p t f d phi zero. Um, This uh, time derivative of this expectation is the is the semi the generator of the semigroup. So you can you can write this as L of f uh, d phi zero, right? I mean, what what are we doing here, right? You're looking at this expected value of the process condition in some initial state, right? And you're taking the time derivative of that. So um, let's say formally, right? You can also see it as if I take the derivative of here, this object, right? Mm -hmm. And then I integrate, it um, should give me the same answer. And when I take the time derivative of pt, I get L, the infinitesimal generator. Um, but then I'm, I'm missing something. Wait, um, I'm missing something here. Now if I take the derivative of pt, should be, is L applied to PTF? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I might as well just, this is what, what you do here. Uh -huh. Just use that instead. Okay, so actually we can just directly go from that. Um, and now, <laughs> Now you can pull this back using the, the definition of the adjoint. So this is going to tell you that you get the integral of p t l um, f d phi 0. OK, so um, yeah, the conclusion is then that uh, L, of course, also is going to compute with the adjoint. That's, that's just uh, properties of linear operators. But then you get, let's see. Uh, this is the forward equation um, that says that for every t greater than or equal to 0, if you take the time derivative of p t star by 0, so that's what we're doing here. We're taking the time derivative of that operator, uh, that gives me the, uh, ah, yeah. Um, gosh, I can, I can either go from here 
Yeah. Maybe I can just. I can also take the i joint of L here and kind of pull it inside. So that now is going to tell me something about how this thing is acting on, on uh, functions. So I get f d of L star pt star phi zero. And now this gives me an identity between the derivative of this object with uh, this one. Okay, and that's what I want to write now. So the derivative of pt star by zero is uh, L star uh, pt star um, and this will also commute But I guess this commutation properties, I mean, you can either prove it, but it's also just inherited by the commute, uh, the fact that PT and L commute. If they commute, the adjuncts are gonna commute as well. Um, we're over time already, so, um, yeah, I guess maybe we continue next time. Uh, but with this, I mean, what we're gonna get is, yeah, just to wrap it up and then, um, we continue next week. So the point is that P is going to be stationary for the Markov process if and only if it satisfies that uh, L star of phi is equal to zero and this can also be written down in terms of the expectation with respect to phi of L of F is equal to zero for every F. Okay, so this is going to give a, a functional characterization of when a distribution phi is stationary. And it's directly related to this um, semi-group generator, which we already evaluated for the uh, Langevin diffusion. So we're going to just use that to give an explicit characterization of what's a stationary distribution. Okay, so unfortunately we weren't able to do it today, but next time. Uh, I mean, you can call it no, phi no, zero. No, no, no. Oh, here, here. There's a phi zero missing. Yes, for sure. Yeah. Okay, thanks. It's new for me. Right? <laughs> oh, it's also new for me. So, uh, <laughs> but this, I, I find this very nice because it sort of gives us this like functional characterization of uh, stationarity, which we will see that is very explicit for Langevin. So, uh, 